Amen. Amen. Holy are you, Lord. The scripture has already been read for you uh, this morning as we continue in our series, the second part, from sitting to serving. I want to tag this one, if you don't mind, hard work pays off. Hard work pays off. Let us pray, oh God, not me but you. Make me nothing so that you can be everything you need to be in me and through me so that your word would bless those that's been assigned to and not return to you void. I surrender now, God, all of me to all of you so that the words of my mouth but the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight. God, you are a strength and our holy redeemer. In Christ's name we pray, amen. They gave me a new clock. It works. Hard work pays off. Paul uh, gives a reality check to the church at Colossae or the Colossian people as he does to all of us to remind us that serving God isn't easy. And yet the truth of the matter is that many of us who come to Christ don't know that we live under the assumption that being a Christian or a servant of God is easy work. We don't realize it until God places us or push us beyond the threshold of our faith. That people will be with you as long as you don't stretch them where they don't want to go. Pastor, as long as you don't preach, I'm going to just say too long. I'm going to hang with you. As long as, long as uh, the church don't go too far to the right or too far to the left, I'm going to stay with you. As long as you don't challenge my own belief, I'm going to be with you. And, 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 and they really are saying, you know, God, as long as you... Don't say no to my requests and don't ignore my problems. You and I can walk together. And when God pushes our, us to the edge of faith, we act like slaves and we think we're going to run for freedom. Not realizing as a Christian, when you run from God, you don't run from freedom, you run into captivity. And you will be a slave to the success for which you chase, but never be free to enjoy it peacefully because being a Christian is hard work. <laughs> and, and Paul does something. Um, he, he, I, I don't think Paul is advocating slave living in this text. I think that Paul has pulled the reality that slavery exists and uses it as an example to give a spiritual teaching about the difficulty and the hard work of serving God. That, 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 it is Paul who will go into the next chapter of this same book and say, I recognize the harshness and the oppression of slavery that he calls the master to show justice and fairness to the slave. So Paul doesn't advocate slavery, but he used a reality of life to explain the hard work of serving God. That is Paul's M.O., 
when he, when he went up on Mars Hill to talk to the Aristotles of Athens, who was looking for truth, but did not know the truth of God, he pulls out something they did know, a statue, and said, I'm going to name your unnamed statue, God, that you might know the realness of his existence. It was Paul who sat in a prison cell and looked over at the Roman guard and the uniform and put pen to paper and wrote to the church's Ephesus after looking at the soldier's uniform, said to the Christian, put on the whole armor of God. It is Paul who finds himself in a jail cell with his buddy Silas and there he sits beaten and thrown in the cell and as he sat in the confines of a prison at midnight he turned the cell into a worship center so that a jailer might be saved and prisoners might be set free. Come on in here. Because Paul has this knack for taking a part of reality and pushing it into a place of spiritual teaching and so now he comes to the church at Colossae at the time that he writes the letter it is understood that the church ain't doing so bad as a matter of fact they're doing real good but Paul knew that the day would come that Christianity would fall under attack they would be under attack and their faith will be pushed to the edge they will be stretched they will find themselves in a place where they're like Abraham and they may be pushed to go where they cannot see or like Noah to build for a future they have no clue that exists or be like Ruth and leave the certainty of supply for the greater love of her mother-in-law or like Sarah believe that you can get life out of what has been barren that life and serving God is not a rose garden but it will push you to a place where you want to where people have known to be known to have fallen over fallen out and fallen away from God because somebody forgot to tell them this ain't no rose garden it's hard work <sighs> so Paul says like slave to master one, one translation says this way I'm going to use the word he says if you're going to be a servant of God you and I must learn to comply to what God tells us and in the text, it says, show obedience. That, that if we are going to be servants of the Lord, the difficult challenge for Christians is to comply to what God says, especially when it's not what we want. <laughs> because I've come to understand that wherever there's true obedience, there's the presence of sacrifice. And, 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 and sacrifice is the struggle that we have with obedience or, comply, or complying with God. Because whenever God calls us to obey, it will never be greeted with, yes, Lord, where there's sacrifice. But you know when you're under the umbrella of obedience because you're hesitant to say yes and you want to really say no. And because when God calls us to comply to something, sacrifice simply means this. You're going to have to release something you want to keep. <laughs> I don't know if they still do this uh, billboard, but there's a billboard they used to have, and uh, the, the cow is putting up the poster for Chick-fil-A. And, and on the poster, the cow encouraged you to keep eating chicken. And, and you know why the cow is telling you to keep eating chicken. He says, because if you keep eating chicken, I ain't got to sacrifice me to give you a steak. And that's what, uh, that's what obedience feels like sometimes, that you got to sacrifice all of you to feed somebody else. That's what a servant does, isn't it? You, you do your thing to help somebody else's thing. But we have a real problem when it comes to complying to God because we don't want to sacrifice something 
something that we want to keep, the time that we could use for ourselves, money that we can spend on ourselves, pleasures that we can feel for ourselves. But when you are a servant, you just comply to what God says and you run and walk by the anthem. Where he leads me, I will follow even when I find it difficult to walk that way. Hey. So he says, he says, he says, he says, he says, comply. A servant of the Lord must comply to the call of his master. Obey. Then he says something else. He says, um, uh, don't serve uh, like the eyes of men or for the eyes of men. And, and don't, don't, don't just serve to... To, let me, I like the message Bible. The Bible, the message Bible says, don't serve God doing the minimum. <laughs> don't, don't, don't serve God uh, 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 with the attitude, I'm just going to get by. Don't, 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 don't have an a, a, a attitude that you can divide your time with God and think God going to be satisfied. He, he, he really says, he says, when, when, if you're going to serve God, you're going to have to complete and serve in a way that pleases him and not you. That's the rest of the match we have in the church today. We got a whole lot of people serving God on their own terms. And don't want to serve God on his. He says, you need to complete. And I know this. When, you, when we were in school, I know what an I grade is. An I grade means incomplete. Meaning, meaning that what you did was you completed the work where you thought it would get you by. But the teacher said, no, you didn't finish what I asked you to do. And, and this is what Paul is saying. Don't get an eye grade and think that God going to let you slide. And if I may, if I may, if I may uh, uh, kind of detour off the track today, I think that as African-American people, we got to understand that we have, I'm scared that we are operating under an incomplete grading. Uh, I, 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 I'm convinced, uh, Reverend Young, that we, we don't have the zeal or the fight that we used to have for racism when, 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 when it was Jim Crow. I, I, I'm a firm believer that, that we have become comfortable in the minimum freedom that we have. I, I, I'm convinced that we have been bamboozled again, that, that Negroes have become too happy because we, we, got a, we got a job that pays, a house to live in, a car to drive, and clothes to wear, and seemingly have forgotten that racism is still alive and well, and they're still spitting in our faces. Come on in here. I ain't going to stop there. Because while we think we have made it, there is still a disparity in employment. We may have a lower in unemployment now, but there's still a disparity in position and pay. There is still a disparity in education. We are still below the average score of our counterparts, there is still a disparity in economics. We spend the most money, but we don't have the greatest wealth. And, the, and then to top it off, we might be the smallest in population, but we are the largest incarcerated. And we want to talk about, I think there's an incomplete in racism. And, you, and if you don't believe me, look at what's in front of you. You have an official that can wear blackface, his wife can hand out cotton, and no Negro can get them move. Uh, you got one up there in political office that calls our beautiful county by the N-word, but nobody can get to it. And now Negroes are trying to fight other fights, and they don't realize civil rights and affirmative action no longer deal with us, and they can just say no to our demand and still hold powers of position because too many 
many of us are happy with the minimum freedom that we think we have? We fighting battles that have that are just gonna go through with uh, with or without my black face. And when the preacher tells us the truth, we get mad. So what society has done is put us in another race. So we forget about the race we need to be in so we can make a difference. I can't let it go. Me Too was created by a black woman but didn't get any recognition until a white woman stood up. Come on in here, somebody. Black Lives Matter is now all lives matter because we don't make a difference. Come on in here, somebody. Now Obamacare is starting to become Trump care because we don't matter. And now we're fighting a war that doesn't even matter for about us. And you're going to get mad at the church? Race is still our elephant. And I'm a firm believer, when we fix racism, we can fix all isms. I had to calm myself down. Wait a minute. So, 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 let me tell myself a story. So I can stay in the mind. Complete the task. Come on, give me a story. Lord. Here we go. In our home, now let me tell y'all this. I got to do this now. I only tell my story because I tell y'all story, y'all get mad. So I always go in my household because I don't mind. I can get my wife get mad at me, but I kiss her. she would be all right. But anyway, so in my household, the children, they can, they can fool daddy. So we have this motto in the house that um, when they were little kids that you could, you can go out on, you can do your Friday thing, but you have to finish your homework and um, you have to clean your room. And sometimes mommy would go out and the children would clean the room and daddy's the inspector. And daddy would inspect the house and so they'll call, the children would call and say, mommy would clean the room, do the homework, can we do ABC? She said, let me speak to your father. Father get on the phone, I get on the phone. She says, um, is the room clean? I say, yeah, it's clean. Did the homework? Yeah, it's clean. I mean, done. All that done. So then she comes home, and she begins to show me. I asked me, yes, she do. She walk in. She walks walking. Um, 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 um. I thought she said the room was clean. <laughs> I said, it was. It looked good. So she said, go look at it. So I go in and look at it, Miss Barbara. And when I look at it, it looked clean to me. But then she showed me all the cubby places, the holes that they hide things and how they put dirty clothes and they put them away like they're clean. She, she started showing me what they do to the house. I said, oh, so then, so no longer am I allowed to inspect the house. So now if she had to call, this is how she ended the call. She put them on the phone. She said, you do your homework? Yeah. She says, the house clean? She said, yeah. Then she says this, is it mommy clean? <laughs> She said, because daddy clean is incomplete. Your clean is incomplete. But mommy's clean is incomplete. Come on, let me help you. When you serve in God, I don't want to know if it's all right with you, but is God satisfied with what you're putting out? Is the Lord going to say to you, well done? Who's going to put a stamp of approval on the work? And Paul says, not until God says it's good. Is it any good? So, 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 so I done settled down now, just a little bit, because stories of my own life helps me. I hate to tell you, I don't mean to be selfish, but he says the other thing, he says, and do it when you serve, you got to be committed. He, he says, he says that, that, um, that, that you got to do it heartily. And he always say when he, he said, do it as if you're doing it or knowing you're doing it for God. I like to put it that way. 
So, so that, that means that if you're going to be a servant, you have to be all in. You have to be committed. So let me tell you this, this last story and I'm done. I, I learned commitment. Y'all remember my late, our late, our late dog, Harley? Yeah. Harley did now. And uh, y'all know me and Harley had a rough time. And I got to tell y'all the story because I can tell it now. I couldn't tell it, you know, at the corner because they were grieving. I didn't grieve like that. But let me tell you the story. I'm going to tell them, I'm going to tell them something that, that I never told them. Now, can you, can you look at me like that? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you look at me and go, oh, watch it. Erica, you can listen. Uh, here you go. Harley and Reverend Williams can account to this. He and his wife, we were in the car. Harley got really sick. And the children were crying. Harley said, got to take him to the vet. So the mother said, go ahead and take him to the vet. So when they called back, the vet gave a whole list of things that were wrong with Harley. And I, all I know is Harley's bill was up to $2,000. And I looked at her and said, look like Harley, get ready to go. Yes, I did, because I wasn't that committed. I said, Harley gone. <laughs> but buy some roses. <laughs> and, and, and I thought Williams and his wife were going to crawl over in the back, because I meant that. Harley dead. So, so my wife, feeling the pain of, she said, the children, she's going to give Harley a second opinion. So, so, so we take, we take Harley to the vet and remind, remind you every time you walk in, it's like taking a human. You got to pay a copay and ain't co is full pay to see if Harley going to live. <laughs> so we take Harley to the, for a second opinion and come find out Harley ain't as close to the grave as we thought. Now the, the kids and the mother got the giggles. I, I just kind of looked at them like, mm, uh, Harley's still around. But this is a story they don't know. Finally, death caught up with Harley. <laughs> and it was time to take Harley in. And I never told them this truth came in. Took him into the to the to the vet. And the vet said, um, Mr. West, Harley's kidneys are failing. Harley's old. Harley's not gonna make it. He said, now what we can do is some kind of thing they can flush him out. He said it'll cost about twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> Y'all stay with me. <laughs> but this true story. So when I, when I called my wife, I said, look what I said. I said, Harley, Harley gone. <laughs> Y'all stay with me now. Because I got to keep, keep, keep my reputation up. But, but Reverend Young, this is what she don't know. When I got back home, I got to thinking about that thing. I looked at Harley, and I called the doctor back. And I said, Doc, how much that thing gonna cost to flush him out? And Mr. Murphy can attest that this is true. The doctor then said to me, I see you love, you love that dog. But Mr. West, I put the option on the table. But the point of the truth is this. You can flush him, but he's just going to continue to suffer. You're wasting your money. How come you can call Mr. Murphy? Because I know Mr. Murphy has dogs, and I shared it with G.C. Murphy. And he said to me, Reverend, I know what he's talking about. It's a waste of of your money y'all come on in here but i was committed uh, that whatever it was going to cost uh, to keep holly alive and i really wasn't all totally in love with him but i was willing to pay the price uh, if it was going y'all ain't got it yet 
when you're committed to God, you may not always like what God is saying, but whatever God it calls, you should say, I'm committed enough that whatever the price is, God, I'm going to pay the bill because I know serving you is hard work. I'm done. But when Paul finishes, before he sits down, before he shuts up, he says, but let me assure you, hard work pays off. Go on to the 24th verse. He says, when you have complied, completed, committed, be confident that all the work you put in to serve God will be worth it at the end. I, 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 come on, Holy Ghost. When, I read, when they read it this morning, this is, I, I saw it for the first time. It says this, if you do the work of a servant, you will receive the inheritance that Jesus left. Y'all ain't got it yet. Y'all should be on your feet. That means you might work hard, but the suffering of the day won't compare to what the Lord has in store for you. When I think about Jesus, just don't call his name, but know what he stands for. He stands for justice. He stands for mercy he stands for love he stands for forgiveness he stands for salvation you still don't have it yet if you serve the Lord fighting injustice you will inherit justice if you serve the Lord fighting against cruelty you will inherit mercy if you serve the Lord fighting hate you will get loved if you serve God fighting for uh, sin you will get salvation how do I know because when he died he gave me the key and said all power hard work but it will pay off in the end you'll be better for what you get than what you give hey Isn't that the truth of humanity? Isn't that how we work? You can go and look at the job, and I promise you, they'll tell you what the job is. They tell, they'll tell you what you have to do, and you're going to decide if you're going to work that hard based on the bottom line. Paul says to the servant, you're going to work hard. This ain't no peaches and cream ministry. You can't just come in here and take a seat. Or you going to participate if you're a Christian. And so let me do it. You're either going to do it with your legs or you're going to do it with your arms. And if you can't do it that way, you're going to do it with your hand in your pocket. <laughs> and whatever way we serve him, it's not going to be easy. Because our task will always be the same. To speak truth to power. And our call is to always try to bring the lost souls to Jesus. And so I commend and present and recommend to you, since we are serving something, I encourage you to serve God. 
do the work for the Lord. Because this I do know. He'll keep his promise. He'll keep his promise. He'll keep his promise. I'm telling you, he'll keep his promise. And whatever you're dishing out won't match what he's giving back. Keep working for the Lord. If you love him today, you can work it out today. Just give him a hand praise. If you want, you can give him a standing ovation. Let him know that you're here to serve. You know it's hard. It may be difficult, but he's worthy. That's really what you're saying. You're, he's worthy of all that I have to offer. He's worthy of it today. Oh, yes, he is. No one I know has been so great that he would die for my mess and love me in my mess so that we can get out of this mess. And he is worthy of our, all our service. And the people said, amen amen as we're standing on our feet this morning as we stand to our feet let, let, let's let, at this point let's go to let's go to point number two you you got dressed you you drove up you you got in, in, in you got out the car you know, walked in the church. You got a seat at the pew. One more step. Let's complete the movement. Now the doors of the church are open. One more step. Give the pastor your hand. Because God has your heart. somebody needs to hear this today because we need to think about that when we come how far we have come to be in the service and we get this close and we walk away from serving we get this close and don't complete the walk Don't let your movement today be an incomplete service unto God. Let's complete it today. And let me be clear. Don't hear me calling you. Because this I know, you can tell me no every Sunday. But if you can hear God using me to call you. The invitation is extended. The Lord invites whomsoever will. The table is set. The doors are open. The arms of God are open to you. I've extended it. Will you receive it? In Jesus' name, will you receive it? Come on. Bless you. Y'all need to give the Lord a hand praise. I can't wait to tell you about the prophetic voice on this life right here. Come on up here, darling. Don't let her stand by herself. Don't let her stand. Thank you, Kane. Don't let her. Oh, I got a story to tell about this one. Because the Lord is moving in a mighty way. But, but, but let me make sure. Is there another? I told y'all this. I, I have matured a lot. I don't get greedy at the buffet. I eat just enough when I go to one. Isn't that good? What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> I get just enough, but when it comes to soul saving, I get greedy. I'm happy for one, but I don't mind two, three, or four, or five. And so the door is still open. Come and make God happy. Make the saints jump and make the devil mad. Is there another one that will come? Come in Jesus' name. Don't come in no, no don't come in the name of the church or the pastor. Because we need them just as bad as you do. But together we can get there. Together we can get there. Thank God for the one who has come. Give the Lord a hand praise. The altar is open.
Those who want to pray, if you follow uh, Minister Green to the back, and I believe Mrs. Smith is back there to greet you, the altar is open for prayer. Joy, concern, problem, praise. What you want to do is come, hold the hand of your neighbor. If you take a moment to pray, I'm going to come back and pray with you collectively. <laughs>